Good evening and welcome to the Korea Society's Young Professionals Network Program Series. I'm Ji Young So, the Senior Director of the Development of the Korea Society. The Korea Society's Young Professionals Network Series, also referred to as our YPM program, consists of industry professionals who share their career experiences and advice with the audience. It generates opportunities for young professionals networking as well. In today's episode, the Society has invited businesswoman Angie Byun. Angie is a dear friend of the Society who established an astonishing career in international media, entertainment, and lifestyle industries. Angie currently holds the position of a CEO at her own global lifestyle consulting firm called AB World, where she focuses on maximizing intellectual property assets in Asia and strategic market around the world. Prior to starting AB World, Angie was at Condé Nast for 13 years and held various executive level positions in new business development, sales, and international licensing for brands like Vogue, GQ, The New Yorker, Wired, and Golf Digest. As one of the most senior Asian American business women in media, she is also actively involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives and has brought multicultural talent into the forefront of the entertainment, luxury, and sports industry. Angie received her JD from the University of Wisconsin Madison Law School and studied at the University of California at Berkeley and at New College, Oxford University. Today's discussion will be moderated by Asia James, Director of Emerging Audiences at Condé Nast. Asia is also the chair of the Women's Network at Condé Nast and an inaugural member of the Global Diversity Employee Committee. Now, please join me welcome Angie and Asia. I hope you all enjoy the conversation between two highly accomplished women. Thank you. Asia, now screen is yours. Great, thank you so much for that intro. And I'm so excited for this full circle moment to lead you guys in conversation with more than a mentor to me, but a really dear friend, Angie, to really speak about all of the, the magic and the experiences that she's had throughout her career. What a storied career. So I, I won't spend too much time on the amazing intro and how we're excited to dive in. But Angie, I will say I, I, there's some antidotes for this call where I wanted to tell all of our audience that Angie and I meet monthly and we met at Condé Nast, but our relationship has really thrived. And I am so blessed to be here today to really walk through what an experienced woman this is and how much information she has for young professionals. So thank you so much to the Korea Society and we can jump right in. I also want to include that at the end of this conversation, we'll have time for a Q&A. So if you have any questions for Angie, please drop those questions inside of the YouTube um, chat function and we'll be sure to answer as many as we can at the end of the program. Angie, you ready? Yes, thank you so much, Asia. Um, first and foremost, um, I want to say Anyanghaseyo, Kamsamida to the Korea Society. I want to say um, thank you so much to Jiyoung Sa um, for hosting us this fine evening um, during a pandemic. And I'm really honored to be here tonight um, to speak to uh, members of the Korea Society as well as young professionals. Amazing. And to really jump us off, for those of you who are not familiar with the amazing Angie and your role, and before you decided to start um, and be the CEO of AB World, can you give us a little snapshot on what it was leading up to starting a company of your own, especially on the cusp of a pandemic? <laughs> That's a great question, Asia. And um, yes, absolutely. So um, you know, while, as uh, Ji Young mentioned, um, while I was at Condé Nast um, for those 13 years, and while actually we were working together, Asia, um, I started to really um, learn more and more and actually started to work more and more in Asia and more, do more business development deals out there and also more um, international business development deals um, around the world, in particular in emerging markets like the Middle East and other places like in South Africa, uh, South America and South Africa actually too. 
And so while um, I was at Condé Nast, I was starting to see that, um, you know, there was a lot of growth and development in these particular countries. Um, and so it's interesting because I was kind of doing a side hustle um, at Condé Nast while I was, you know, doing my main hustle. Um, and that kind of morphed into um, me really carving out this business within the company to represent um, more brands who wanted to um, either uh, enter into the U.S. market or represent our brands at the, at the time at Condé Nast to go into places like Asia, particularly in uh, places like Korea, China, and Japan. Um, so my side hustle, um, you know, was developing at Condé Nast, and I had a lot of great bosses and mentors who were very, very supportive of just being very entrepreneurial within the company. Um, and fast forward last year, I decided I was going to start my own um, global consultancy where we represent um, media companies, entertainment companies, um, essentially anybody who has IP and content um, who seek to monetize or grow their business internationally. Um, likewise, I'm also advising companies um, in Asia in particular who want to cross over um, into the United States to build their brand awareness and also um, increase their market and sales. Amazing. And I know we're going to dive into details on how you're able to monetize and actually cross pollinate with international markets here in the US, but really want to set the stage because what's so interesting about Angie is your upbringing. So could you give us a brief snapshot on your upbringing and you know what, where you grew up, how has it been for you being a Korean American, you know, everything that really makes the foundational work and so important as you're a young professional coming up in the industry. Can you give us a snapshot on what that was like for you. Yes, absolutely. So I was born in California. Um, so in my heart, I'm kind of like this laid back, easygoing person, um, but grew up in San Francisco. And I think, um, you know, if anyone has um, been to San Francisco, grew up in San Francisco in the 80s or 90s, um, it was a great place to uh, have a childhood um, during that time because it was quite progressive and it was extremely diverse um, compared to other cities around the United States. So I had the great fortune to grow up in San Francisco. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as a Korean American, the Korean population wasn't that big in San Francisco. Um, so the people that we knew were pretty tight. And so you kind of knew the other Korean Americans um, in the city and it was a pretty small community. Um, but I think the, the expectations as a daughter, as a Korean American daughter, you know, are pretty high um, with Korean parents. So there was always this expectation that, you know, you get good grades, that you are very respectful to um, elders and, you know, whether it's your teachers or your um, parents' friends. So um, there was always this feeling of like, you have to do well, so you don't, you know, embarrass your parents essentially. Um, and, um, but growing up in San Francisco, it was a great experience because I, um, you know, had friends from all different backgrounds. I, it was an urban environment. So you had, you know, all walks of life that you um, grew up with um, from all parts of the city and, um, you know, went eventually to Berkeley for undergrad um, and then went to law school. So, um, but I think the foundation, I would say, you know, having, um, you know, the kind of the Korean culture instilled throughout. We were, we were the type of family that, you know, my parents spoke to us in Korean, but we would always respond in English. So it was like this kind of, you know, hodgepodge um, type of situation. And, and luckily, like we all understood what we were saying. And, um, but we were at the time very much, um, you know, the, the emphasis was like, you have to assimilate, you know, be as Americanized as you can. Um, whereas I think in uh, this, you know, this generation, the young generation, it's like, there's such a celebration of just being yourself. Um, but when I was growing up, it was very much, um, you know, we need to be as Americanized as we can. 
Yeah, and that's so interesting. You, you, what stuck out to me is that expectation that was set, you know, in your, you know, circle and circumference as you were growing up. Um, I know you started your career and your educational career studying political science and history, and you later on went to law school. Can you walk us through that thought process? You know, because we, obviously we know where you landed at AB World at your old consultancy firm. But tell us about those times budding in your career, especially in your educational career, and what that was like for you. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I was always like this, like political geek, you know, I was really, and history geek too. Um, I read a lot of books growing up and I just, you know, for me sitting in an, on a history class was like story time. It was like so interesting, so much fun. Um, and I actually studied European history um, in uh, college and I also double majored in poli sci. Um, and I thought eventually one day I might go into politics or might go into government. At the time, um, it was just one of those things where, um, you know, most kids, if they didn't know what they wanted to do, they often applied to grad school or went to law school. So for me, law school just seemed like, um, you know, I, I didn't really think about it too deeply as far as like, what might it mean to be a lawyer? But it would just seem like a natural kind of next step for a poli sci history major. Um, to go to law school and for somebody who might want to enter into politics. Amazing. Yeah. And could you reflect on some of the moments, especially as you being an attorney, what did you like? What did you dislike? What are some of the learnings from that time period in your career that you travel with you, that travel with you today? Okay. So after law school, um, actually before law school, I had um, a couple of really I would say pivotal um, moments um, as far as work experience. Um, that being, I had interned at the White House my sophomore year. So um, my sophomore year of college, I was like, I'm gonna apply for this internship um, at the White House. And I was accepted into the program. It was an amazing experience, got to meet so many people. Um, and really just, you know, that type of training is like, no else, right? Where there's a certain, as we were talking about, a certain like high expectation of, you know, what you need to do to get the job done, whether it's like answering a phone call to drafting a memo. Um, so when I went to law school, it was a great experience, but I, I had this like, you know, a little bit of this like um, confidence, right? Coming from the White House, going to law school. And, and so when I went to New York for one of my first jobs as a lawyer, what an awakening that was, right? Because um, if anyone has moved to New York and for someone like me, you know, Californian moving to New York, it is an absolute wake up call, right? Because New York uh, does not play, okay? <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had, um, you know, some really great internships, but being a lawyer was actually, and it's, you know, it's interesting to say this, but it was my actual first real full-time job paying and, you know, going from college to law school and not having real work experience um, was quite a culture shock. So I was in for quite an awakening, huge learning curve. And then on top of that, um, being in New York city where people were cut throat, they were 24 seven, they were very aggressive. And for someone like me, you know, who is a little bit more hippy dippy, it was just, you know, really, really, um, you know, quite a culture shock for me. Um, but I just absolutely loved, and what I still love about New York is like there, there is this passion that you see with people that you do not see anywhere else, you know, in my experience um, around the world and, and in other parts of the US. There's just like a hustle, there's a swagger, people have like, they really are, they care about what they do and they have a passion like no other. So it took a bit of time to acclimate and trust you me when, um, you know, I had many a talks with bosses where they were, they were telling me at, at a young age, like, you need to step it up. You need to, um, you know, really pull your weight. And for me, it was like, oh my God, like, you know, you, you don't expect those kinds of things, but it, it, it toughens you up. So I think, um, you know, as a young lawyer being kind of thrown into the um, fire pit was quite a, an experience and quite an awakening. 
Yeah. And I love the way you phrase that, Angie, having that all those honest conversations with your managers. But I think you touched on this a bit, but what is the importance of building a community in those early stages of your career? Because um, personal moment between you and I, I, I have always valued our conversations and your insight and the realness. And oftentimes, especially being a person of color in, in, in a different area, in a new environment, in a legacy company, there are many different challenges that we face that are oftentimes, you know, turn to a blind eye. And I will say uh, something that is so innately beautiful about you, Angie, is you always take the time to share what you have learned and are always open to learning from others. So how important has that been, you know, been in early parts of your career? And could you shed some light on how that is still fueling you today, especially with your own consultancy? Wow. Great question. (laughs) So it, it took a while, you know, it took a while to kind of, um, seek out people in, you know, the various um, places I worked, um, the people that I really wanted to like latch onto, right? Because, you know, oftentimes I found like, oh, if my boss is my boss, they are the end all be all and they're amazing. And I have to give, you know, utmost respect because I was like brought up in that kind of um, environment. But I realized over the years, especially after my first couple of jobs, like I found great inspiration and mentorship in not necessarily my boss, but in other, you know, departments or in other um, divisions, or maybe it was a client. Um, So you, you know, the more you meet people, the more you um, are able to interact with various folks within your industry, you can, you start to sense like who, um, you know, really uh, authentic leaders are and who you want to emulate and, you know, why not reach out to them or why not start to build a um, more of this uh, mentor-mentee relationship. Um, I found that, um, you know, there were times in New York when, you know, people were particularly harsh. Like they would say like, you can't do this or no, or just um, very abrupt, right? Um, And you learn from those folks too. And you learn like, "Mm, maybe that's not my leadership style, or maybe, you know, I want to approach things in a more, um, you know, in a different way. Um, So I think it was important, you know, if I can give any advice um, for young professionals just starting out is, you know, it might just be your, the the person, you know, that is your colleague, or is that, you know, your, um, your work, work wife or your work husband or your buddy that you just have um, a connection with and why not build that relationship as, you know, why not ask for advice or why not um, kind of uh, just build upon that. And so I think um, what's been great um, is, you know, when, when you find people that are generous and are great leaders and are really um, kind and smart, they are typically very um, open to, you know, helping, um, you know, uh, people who, no matter who they are, um, you know, in their journey. And actually one thing that um, I, um, I'll, I'll never forget is when I was at the White House, there was an African-American woman, she was much older and she, for, she knew the Clinton somehow, some way. And she was, you know, working with us um, in our department And she said, you know, Ange, it's no fun when um, people, you know, in an organization, they don't rise together, right? It's just no fun. And so always like look out for people because it's so much more gratifying and enjoyable when everyone can kind of rise up together. Um, And I'll I'll never forget when she said that. And she she was very, um, she was really awesome. And she was like always kind of giving like tidbits and advice. Um, to me, kind of looking out for me too. So, you know, how can you not pay it forward? How can you not, um, especially for women of color uh, in the media industry and the entertainment industry, where we are so underrepresented, you know, it, you cannot help, not help, but to help people that um, are so um, disproportionately underrepresented. 
Amazing. Yeah. And would you share some of those actionable ways in which you um, are able, able to build this community and pay it forward, especially for the young professionals in the room? I think we hear oftentimes you know, reach out, they will respond. What are some practices that were, you know, maybe low hanging fruit for you to sort of break the ice with some of these people that you want to build community with, whether it's an arm's reach, like a work wife, what you mentioned, or someone in leadership or in a network that you're looking to break into? Mm hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, it's such that um, it's not easy to just approach senior people or it's not easy to go into a company, realize that, um, you know, maybe there are no employee resource group groups or there's no diversity and inclusion committee or maybe, you know, you want to um, ask for a raise or promotion. And, um, you know, how do you even approach that and how do you even kind of take that initiative? And so I always found, you know, being Korean American, um, there's this word called nunchi, and my um, friends and I always joke about it, but nunchi essentially means like having sense, right? Like reading a room, right? And so e even at a place like Condé Nast, where, um, you know, you might've been the only person of color, the only woman in a meeting, right? How do you kind of, um, Get institute or execute upon your plan or your initiative or your idea and build coalition, right? It is step-by-step -step relationship by relationship, right? And oftentimes what I sometimes saw were folks who were like guns blazing, like, you know, we want that. And it's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. They're every single company, every single organization, they have a hierarchy in place. They've got their own protocol, they've got their own um, way of doing things. You know, some companies are very like passive aggressive. Some are very like in your face. So you kind of have to have that nunchi or like um, sense to be able to see like, okay, who do I want to um, align with? Who might I want to seek mentorship with? Um, does that person seem like standoffish? Do they seem very warm? Um, and then I also think too, you know, when you do approach someone, whether it's on LinkedIn or it's a cold call, essentially, um, you want to be of service to that person. You want to bring value to that person. Um, I'll give you an example. So when I was, um, so after I had my little internship at the White House, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to like keep on going. Um, and as Jiang mentioned, I had studied at Oxford for a year, um, my junior year of college. And fresh off the heels of that internship, I was like, I want to work at Parliament. You know, I was just in the West Wing and now I'm ready for Parliament. Um, and so I called the Parliament, um, I think it was like the internship program office. And I said, hi, you know, I'm Angie Bian and I, was, I would love to have an internship. Um, you know, I'm going to be here for a year. And essentially the woman was like, uh, you have to be a British citizen. We do not take Americans and you have to be a British citizen. And I said, oh, okay, I guess, I guess I can't intern. And she said, but, and she gave me some really great advice. She said, you know what though? Everybody needs help. So these are six members of parliament that are looking for assistance. They all have bills that they wanna pass. They need people to help them with administrative duties and research. So why don't you reach out to each of these members and see if they can help you or if you can help them. And I was like, oh my God, yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, you know, you might, this, the moral of story is, well, I got the internship from one member of parliament who's like, yes, how soon can you come? Like, I'll pay for your bus ride and lunch and that's about it, but you'll get the great experience. And I was like, absolutely. So I got the internship, but what I'm trying to say in the moral of story is, is, you know, maybe, um, you know, you might not be able to get in the front door but you can certainly go on the side door, the back door, the, you know, upstairs, downstairs, like uh, always, you know, if, if, if there's a certain kind of initiative that you want to enact within a company, or if there's a certain person that you really want to, you know, seek out mentorship with or whatever it might be, you know, persistence pays off, a gentle nudge pays off, um, but also ninchi pays off too, being able to read that room. And I've, I've seen you do that time and time again, Asia, at Condé Nast, where you started 
um, and kickstarted the Women's Network and was the inaugural member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the first ever in its 125 year history. So really amazing stuff. Awesome. And, and, and since we tease out how we've met at Condé and what our experience has been there, I'm going to switch gears a bit just to dive in for the professionals in the room and especially the young folks to really understand at one point at Condé Nash, your title was the head of international strategy and development. And, you know, for those of you to as a refresher, Condé Nash is a global media company who um, are spearheading the likes of brands that we all know and love. So Vogue, Lore, GQ, Golf Digest, Wired, Ours, Technica, Pitchfork, you name it. Angie ran the business for all of these brands, especially being the liaison for our, you know, what is now called a global company, but had functionalities of only catering towards U.S. demographics. So Angie, I would love for you to shed some light on what are some of the foundational methods that you use to help promote that these markets outside of the United States, while we understand politically that they are growing, why was the connection and you being the connector such an important factor for you to bring to Condé Nast? Yeah, so, um, oh my God, great question. Uh, so, you know, when I was at Condé, being one of the only people of color, you know, oftentimes um, in, and having a senior role, I often felt like it was my duty to bring in as many people that, you know, whose voices were not represented in the company. However, um, you know, through whichever channel and through whichever means. So having seen, the incredible and exponential growth of, you know, and at Condé Nast, it's mostly um, luxury products that we are helping to market and, you know, the certain aspirational lifestyle. I was seeing the exponential growth in China. I was seeing the amazing um, entertainment IP coming out of Korea. I was seeing the trends, the, um, the forward trends coming out of Japan. And all of, you know, Lagos Fashion Week coming out of Nigeria. And so I was, you know, really focused on how do we um, essentially, you know, either bring um, this creative talent and these great assets into the United States, or how do we, you know, with our amazing brands at the company, you know, promote these lifestyle brands um, overseas. And to be honest, um, every single, other than my first title, which was like a manager title back in 2006 at Condé Nast, uh, I created my own title at the company. So, um, you know, and I had some really great bosses who were like, maybe not managing director just yet, but how about this, you know? And so <laughs> I was very much, you know, very proactive in, uh, mapping out my career because I knew, and you know, a lot of people tell you after a couple of years, like, you know, HR is not responsible for your career trajectory. HR is not mapping out your career journey. The only person, um, it, you know, is you, right? So if you feel like, um, you know, I'm bringing in the money, I'm, you know, saving the money for the company, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, like, you kind of have to think about, like, okay, what level should I be at? And where, where should I, what should I get paid, you know, if I am due for a promotion? Um, but that's all with a lot of research. That's with talking to various people at the company. And like I said, um, you know, you, you get promoted when you do good work. And in my case, it was like bringing in new deals or um, negotiating, um, you know, renewals or, um, you know, whatever was asked um, and just doing it in a way that, uh, you know, really helped the company. So at the end of the day, it's like, you know, just like that, um, the parliament example, it's like, you kind of always want to think, how can I bring more value to a company? How can I be of service? How can I think, um, you know, more entrepreneurially? Because that's what, you know, at the end of the day, the companies care about. They don't care about Angie Bian. They care about what are you doing for our brands, right? What are you, what are we doing collectively to, you know, all rise together? You, you said it perfectly, Angie, That's, and I would love to just share my own take because as I've been growing my career at Connie Nass the last five years, I love that you have built your own title every step of the way and really responsible for your success in such a global media company to your point with such, um, I would say, 
uh, structures that are influencing the way that we go about and navigate these 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 spaces. So even sharing more of my own personal experience, you were my first stop to really understand how do you pitch a role at a company when you see total opportunity. And as was mentioned at the top of the of the of conversation, my title is the director of emerging audiences. So very similar to you, where can we be on the cusp of what people need, what consumers need, and understanding how we have a monetizable opportunity at stake. There are so many ways to authentically engage with audiences. And that antidote that you shared and exactly what I I'm looking to implement in the role that I just kickstarted, it will take you so far and in, in across industries, not just the media industry, you know? So uh, as we're moving forward, because I know Condé Nast is a luxury fashion and entertainment house and AB World influences so many gambits within that industry, I would love for you to share um, sort of like your business goals or specific achievements that you're looking to accomplish within the first couple years of AB World. Yes, thank you. And congratulations. Uh, Asia is the director of emerging markets um, at Condé Nast, and that was not without you know pitching this title and this department within a company that had previously not you know really focused on say the Gen Z um, you know millennial consumer and uh, consumers of color, which you know as we all know will become the majority. Uh, population in just a matter of years. So congrats to, to you on that. Um, I think for AB World, so, you know, I think for us, what gives me great joy and, you know, what I was doing at Condé Nast, um, you know, right before I had left was I was bringing in, I tried to bring in as many people into that building that normally did not, um, was not represented. So whether it was like Asian, fashion designers or Japanese celebrities or, um, you know, uh, African-American um, speakers. And I was just like, come in and, you know, people would contact me a lot and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I'd love to have coffee and I'd love to have this. And, you know, I would kind of just like um, intentionally parade them around the um, building because I wanted people to see like, look at these K-pop stars, look at these fashion designers. And I would introduce them to as many people as possible. And what would end up is we would then, you know, really help these companies with their marketing strategy, with their digital marketing strategy, with their social media strategy, and also their business strategy. So their sales strategy. Um, and so that's essentially, um, you know, what kind of morphed, as I mentioned to my side hustle into like the main hustle. Um, so we are currently advising three major media companies with their brand, um, uh, international brand development for um, emerging markets, including in Asia, and also an entertainment company who wants to do more um, uh, de development in the United States. Um, there are a couple of other clients, but I cannot disclose who they are. But essentially, the crux of AB World is um, you know, we are helping you promote and build your brand um, in whichever market um, that might be. And that comes from, you know, all the international business development deals that I've done um, over the course of 20 years and doing business in over 30 countries worldwide. Amazing, Angie. And throughout your storied career that you've mentioned, 20 plus years, which is wow, which is amazing to just know how successful and you were able to build your path each step of the way, even entering into AB World. From this new view of you owning your own company and being able to work with some of the partners who used to be competitors, what are you seeing as opportunity? And where do you, um, I, I really would love for you to shape this. What do we need more of? You know, obviously we have a huge lens on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're getting there. But as those seats are being filled, where do you see from your landscape of all of these companies and different stages of the of, of business development, what do you see as your most top concern or, or opportunity? I think, um, you know, for me, it's representation, right? It's um, at one point when I was at Condé Nast, I said, oh, you know, I was hosting this diversity and inclusion um, panel back in 2016. And I said, oh, you know, we're inviting the C-suite to this event. We're inviting um, chief executive officers from various industries. 
um, let's invite the um, you know the most senior executives um, of color at this event at the company at Connie Nass. And I said, okay, so um, who's the most senior Asian woman? And um, they said, that's you. And I was like, whoa, are you serious? Like, I am just at the director level. Like, how can I be the most senior, like what? And then I realized like, yeah, there's no one in the C-suite at the time, nobody at the SVP, nobody at the EVP, nobody at the VP level at the time. So for me, you know, what, what gets me excited, it's representation and trying to bring as many people, um, you know, into the room, into the building, on the golf course, at the gala event, to the Korea Society. And so that for me has always been, um, you know, what I'm the most passionate about. It's, you know, if I look around the room and I don't see a woman at the table, or if I don't see a person of color at the table, I get really like, I got like, there's, there's like a burning, you know, sensation in me where I'm like, I gotta do something about this. You know, this something's not right. And so um, for me, that's, that's kind of the mission of AB world. And really it's like, you know, if I'm a brand, if I'm a say beauty brand um, that I want to go to China, like you just can't, you know, think like, oh, you know, there's so much money to be made in China. It's like, you really need to think about that audience and you need to be mindful of that consumer and not just think like, oh, I just put some Chinese language on there and I'm good to go. Um, no, you know, everything is local um, and you have to be mindful of, you know, the local culture and what's going on geopolitically, what's going on um, with the youth and, and really, um, you know, appreciate their culture, um, you know, and, and I talk a lot too about like cultural appropriation, like, you know, so there's so many, um, you know, people inspired by so many different cultures, um, you know, these days, and it just seems like sometimes like anything goes, but it's really important to um, respect other people's cultures. It's really important to respect, you know, heritage and, and just, um, and, and I think too, you know, um, just this last year with everything going on with um, George Floyd and all the violence towards Asians, there is a heightened sense of, you know, the social injustice that is happening. And as leaders in our respective businesses, like, what are we doing about that? Are we, you know, cause I, I often think like, you know, somebody has got to say something. And if you have the privilege to be in a position of leadership, you, the expectation is that you, um, you know, you say something and you also promote um, activism, however, which way you can. Yeah, totally, Angie. And then for the for our young professionals who, you know, may be on their way to leadership, but are seen as young leaders in representation, especially being a Korean American in the workforce, what is at least one antidote that you can lend them to know, you know, your voice does matter? And what are ways that they can go about amplifying that these causes matter, even if they aren't in a managerial space? Right, right. So what um, what's important is the work, right? So oftentimes, um, you know, people say like, oh, I want to be in media or I want to I want to be in that meeting or I want to go to the Met Gala or I want to go to that, you know, red carpet event. Um, and whatever you want to do and if it's, you know, you want to effectuate change, um, you have to do the work. So as I mentioned, um, you know, you have to show up. You have to knock on that door, send that email. And oftentimes um, what I found is you know, people may not respond, which is like a turnoff, right? Or, ooh, I just emailed them this three paragraph, like amazing email and I didn't get a response. Um, sometimes it's the follow-up email. Sometimes it's the third follow-up email. And, you know, I found that, um, you know, most, um, you know, people at a certain level, they're extremely busy and they're, you know, traveling and they've got a lot of things going on. But I find that most people who are, um, you know, if it's a serious matter, they will respond. Um, and, you know, oftentimes too, you know, you want to come in with solutions, right? I've had many a times when, you know, people are like, can we get a cup of coffee and just like connect? And it's like, you know, time is money and we need to figure out like, what are we gonna do, right? So come with some solutions come with um, some suggestions and, 
And, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised how much, um, I have a great anecdote actually. Um, so, uh, I was at this diversity. It was like the first Vogue diversity and inclusion event. And, um, I had said something, I said, you know, um, I'm getting stopped by security and, you know, they think that I'm a tourist or sometimes a delivery person delivering food at one world trade center. Um, you know, we need to do something about this. Right. And I had said this in a public forum and, um, the next day, um, I go into the office, you know, I'm just like in my coffee, a little groggy, I get a phone call and I went towards the system. Hi, um, Anna would like to see you. Can you come down five minutes? And I was like, oh my God, what, eh, 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 what we, eh. you know, and of course you're like, okay, I got this, right? And so you go down, you have the meeting and Anna's pretty much like, so what are next steps? You were at the meeting, what do you think we should do, right? And so be prepared for those meetings, be prepared for those times when somebody says, you know what, Asia, like, what should we do? You know, and so oftentimes, um, is it, you know, more programming, more training, more um, meetings, more, you know, influential meetings, you name it, like, you have to be prepared, right? And in, in any type of situation, whether it's, um, you know, uh, you know, you wanting more leadership responsibilities or um, you wanting to execute upon a particular idea, you just always want to be prepared. And I found that young professionals who really um, showed their passion and also did the work became extremely successful in their um, respective careers. I love that, Angie. And I also want to, you know, before you just seem and are, because I know you personally, but for those getting to know you this evening, especially as young professionals, um, what is something that brings you joy? How are you finding peace and leveraging your mental health? You are the one of the most efficient boss leaders that I've ever met in my career. How, are, how do you balance it all? You have an amazing family. Can you just give us some insights to how do you, you know, have it all? How do you balance it all? And like, what are some tips or books that you can share with this community to help you really just stay sane, especially with everything we have going on in the world. Mm-hmm. Oh, you should have seen me an hour ago, Asia. <laughs> um, no, I um, I am a big believer of a really great night's sleep. I become what we call Crankosaurus Rex if Mama doesn't get eight hours of sleep. So I need a good solid, you know, eight hours of sleep. And when I have eight hours, it's like, I could do anything. Like I can, you know, go from like eight to, you know, whatever, whenever I need to end work. But I think having really good sleep makes such a difference. And sometimes, you know, you get your six to seven hours, uh, but you try to like sneak in a little power nap or you try to just, um, you know, make it up. But I think um, having a good night's rest is, is really, really great for mental health to just rejuvenate. And, you know, oftentimes in our culture, we're like, you know, sleep is kind of like poo-poo because we're always kind of like, um, uh, I guess, boasting about, you know, how much we're working and how much we're going out and this and that and so busy. But I think, um, you know, take care of your sleep cycle, you know, whether it's listening to meditation music on YouTube or, um, you know, maybe, taking a melatonin, um, you know, vitamin or whatnot, but I think sleep is important. Exercise too, but I find that, um, you know, it's been on and off with the weather outside and, you know, I used to do my little soul cycles, but um, now we have the Peloton. So that's been um, a saving grace throughout this, the pandemic. Um, As far as books, uh, I love my Murakami books. Um, I just find them so interesting and it's, it's a nice escape. I do read a lot of business books, um, which has kind of led me to do more public speaking because, uh, you know, I read a lot of business and management books and, um, you know, Tony, Tony Morrison once said, uh, write the book that you want to read right? Or write the book that's not out there and you want to read it. And I think when it comes to business and when it comes to leadership and management, there are hardly any books written by women of color, written by Black women, 
written by Korean American women. So, you know, my dream is to one day write um, a business management leadership book um, and really get into the nitty gritty of like, how do you negotiate a deal? How do you negotiate a deal when someone is extremely sexist? How do you go negotiate a deal when, um, you know, you have two hours of sleep and, you know, you have a gun to your head? Like, just like the real life experiences, um, and then also, how do you negotiate a deal in a different country? How do you negotiate a deal as a woman in Korea? Um, I mean, you and I could probably write at Asia, but um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, insights from various executives that we know that could um, really shed some light um, for people like you and me who want to attain, you know, um, or reach a certain level and um, really are quite ambitious. Totally. And Angie, I'm going to hold you to us collaborating on that amazing book that so many people need, including myself. Um, as we lead into and I'm going to go into, we have a great question inside the Q&A. I do want to end a final prompt and say the Korea Society is a nonprofit organization that promotes awareness, understanding and cooperation between people in the United States and Korea, um, especially the Young Professionals Network. Pursuing, the, pursuing this mission, we arrange programs and everything that run the gamut from exchange of research, research to understanding topics around public policy, business, education, and intercultural relationships and arts. Um, among them is this amazing network for young professionals, which marks its 10 year anniversary this year, which is like completely crazy. Um, would you please give the Korea Society and the Young Professionals Network any comments or encouraging messages more than what you did today because you have really blown it out the water. Is there any final thoughts that you have and you wanna leave these young folks with this evening? Wow. Um, thank you, Asia, for supporting the Korea Society. Love it. Love you. Um, I would say this, you know, sometimes, you know, you may be looking for a mentor, you may be looking for a role model, uh, and that person maybe perhaps does not exist in your organization. So you have to be your own role model. You have to be your own cheerleader. When the going gets tough, you got to like, um, really support yourself and like, you know, kind of psych yourself too, because there may not be that person who has your back. There may not be that person who's like, you got this Asia, you know, and what do you do in those situations? You kind of have to like be your own cheerleader. You, you, you know, you got this, you know, th what we're doing, unless, you know, no, no um, knock on the rocket scientists, but what we're doing, it's not rocket science. Right. So, you know, step by step, if you kind of plan things accordingly, read the room, really kind of um, have done your homework, you, you've got this, you know, you are more than capable, you are um, capable of greatness, right? Um, but sometimes you just have to be your own role model. You have to, as my mom said one time, one time I was like off to Dubai for a business meeting, my mom was like, that's a Angie, yeah, that's a man's job. You get tell the man to go there. You you have to stay home. You're doing a man's job. And I said, Mom, I'm not doing a man's job. It's because there's no other women that have done this before me. So, you know, we gotta we gotta blaze the trails, right? And so if you have to be the one that needs to blaze that trail, like God bless, but you got this, you know. And so I think um, you know. You gotta do the work, but know that greatness will come. Love it, Angie, and, and retweeting all of it. And here's a great question that we got um, actually for both of us, but I would love your take before I jump in. So they're asking, how do, you, how do we both leverage our data and strategy and operations, especially in our roles? And what are some of the potential dangers and benefits that we can share as well as around data targeting, advertising, as we engage with consumers and viewers? So a loaded question that I love because everything starts with insights, whether it's personal insight, behavioral trend insights. Um, I think that's what really makes makes us, I will say, people of color so unique because we run the gambit on how we approach culture. So I would love to know, especially within AB World with this question, how are you leveraging strategy and operations to move your message forward? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, you know, as everyone is talking about these days, it's, it's all about the data. It's data, data, data. Like, um, how are you able to sell or, you know, get new clients to buy into your services? 
you have to show them the data. You have to show them the power, and sometimes my case, the power of the consumer. You know, during the pandemic, the Chinese consumer was spending on luxury. During the pandemic, China's GDP、um, increased year over year. So, you know how you leverage that data and how you're able to、um, effectively communicate that to your clients, to your prospective clients, to prospective partners is very important. It's all about the data, right? And so,、um, and then afterwards, when you、um, implement a program, so if you are, I think the question had to do with advertising. You have to measure that data, right? If you do、um, a social media cam- campaign on, say, Instagram, and you're finding that people are, you know, clicking likes, but perhaps not engaging with your content, not commenting, like, what does that mean for your brand, right?、Um, or maybe they're looking at the,、um, you know, the post or you know, the story or whatnot. But they're not,、um, you know, they're not buying. They're not clicking to buy whatever product. So、um, it's everything these days is data driven.、Um, but sometimes too, you do have to trust your instinct and your gut as far as like, you know, why things aren't, you know,、um, performing the way it should.、Um, but trust you me, you know, how we make decisions right now, and sometimes it's it's quite overwhelming with all of the data points. Yeah, and that's that's a great segue for what I was mentioning, especially in the role as director of emerging audiences at Condé, where、um, we're at a legacy company which has its a great plethora of IP based on subscribership and how they frequent our sites. But where we are finding opportunity is how we can package some of that data to better drive our advertising campaigns, which Angie mentioned. But what's so interesting about data, especially for new markets and especially again for diverse audiences who have such an evolved spending habit and frequency. Amongst all platforms, is understanding the intersectionalities of how to really market what that means to be a person in society. So, as a consumer could come in, or your partners or clients can say, "Hey, guys, like we would love to reach, you know, Korean Americans. So, are we speaking Korean Americans geographically that are, you know, grown up in the East Coast and how they maneuver their lives? Are we looking at them on the West Coast? Are we looking at, you know, young professionals? So, we have to look at generational geographics and really tell a unique story that will over. Plug in how they consume and respond to your content, and I will say it's it's all in the data. And I, I especially for these emerging markets, when sometimes the data isn't as strong, it doesn't tell the story that you want to. You, like Angie said, you use your gut and you figure out the best way to really sell the importance of this audience. Because sometimes they, you know, what's missing is they just haven't been spoken to authentically, and that may not be a great form of measurement. But we always have to try, and then we reform and. Refine our engagement with these communities, but、uh, as Angie mentioned five times, data, data, data. It charges everything that we all do. No matter if you're running your own company like Angie at AB World, or you're working at a legacy spot like me at Condé Nast, and figuring out what do you do with all this data while also piling on how the market is responding to us.、Um, there's so many opportunities. So really grateful for that question. And as we close out tonight, I really want to give a generous thank you to everyone at the Korea Society. And everyone who's involved with the Young Professionals Network, who joined us this evening to just feel the grace that I get to have all the time from Angie and and this video and the audio will be distributed shortly. You can find it on the Korea Society's website as well as the YouTube channel.、Um, connect with all of us on all forms of networks, and we're totally open to answer questions. That's I will say the sweet spot with it, which has bonded Angie and I together. So, any last thoughts, Angie, before we close out this evening? Oh my goodness.、Um... Yeah, no. Thank you so much. It's been an honor,、um, and you know, join the Korea Society. And what, one last thing, though,、um, there would be no Golf Digest in Korea right now if it weren't for the Korea Society. So、um, I went to a Korea Society 60th anniversary event. Was able to meet the new um, licensing um, publishing partner for Golf Digest at that event. So you never know when you're going to meet people, and it was through the Korea Society that we were able to find a new partner for Golf Digest. So pretty cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Angie, for that, and I look forward to hearing more from you and then our book collaboration. Yes, thank you,、everyone. Asia. Love you, and I appreciate this tremendously. And、um, you know, if anyone's watching, Asia's awesome. 
shake an MC or, um, you know, moderate your next event. And I think she's, she's just a great person. So all support for you. Thank you so much for this and have a good evening, everyone, and see you soon.